You know, I've been thinking about this. And taken with a grain of salt. Speaking of salt, hmm. yesterday's breakfast. <laughs> My wife says always makes up a big batch of scrambled eggs or kind of like a skillet, skillet breakfast. So that way there's some the next day. And uh, I get a chance to eat them the next day. Can you hear the turtle dove? Beautiful. Today, they tell me is Palm Sunday. And mostly, for the most part, I treat every day the same, but sometimes, you know, it's good to keep track of certain days that God has said to keep track of. You know, to celebrate, to rejoice in, to be glad, to point them out as certain way markers of how far you've come. You know, people do that with birthdays, anniversaries. They remember lots of details and things that probably aren't as important as what God tells us to remember, but mostly evangelical people don't spend too much time celebrating the things that God has said. And I don't mean like the holy days, you know, on Easter or, you know, like the Feast of the Lord or those kind of things, but really certain days that maybe we could do better or be different. Sometimes I think we're too cool to be Christian. You know, we add our whosoever name at the end of our name or put it in the middle, you know, to be cool. Oh, we we got to identify ourselves. We're one of them. You know, and it's cool to be, you know, a whosoever, you know, because those are the rockers now. Or, you know, we go out and, you know, we see, hey, you know what? All them uh, Calvary people ride Harleys. I want to go get a Harley, you know. Harleys for Jesus, Christ disciples, riders, whatever, you know, motorcycle riders for God. You know, so we want to head down the highway to heaven, you know. And it's usually not any other bike, but it's got to be a Harley. Now, I don't know about you, but Harleys aren't the best bikes in the world. They just happen to be the most fashionable one. So, I'm always interested in the ways Christians get caught up in the world. Because that's what it is. I mean, it's it's status. I mean, you can't tell me any other reason why you buy a Harley. <laughs> it's status. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. And then as you watch these TV shows, you know, where they show bike riders and gangs, you know, getting together, you know, like, oh, well, we're all, you know, we're all, we're all the same. We put on our leathers, you know, and get cool. I think about these things. You know, one of the things I think about is Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem, was expected as the Messiah. The people had expectations of how God would come and reveal himself. He would come in the sky, you know, with ten thousands of his angels proclaiming, you know, the salvation of Israel. Oh, no, no, no. He would cast off the Roman emperor, you know, and set us free because Jesus sets us free. Oh, no, he'll come like, you know, the the conquering king, you know, and he'll have fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand and he'll slash and burn and kill and maim. No, 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 no. He'll come as a suffering servant. You know, he won't even bend a smoking flax or he won't quench a smoking flax or bruised reed he will not bend and break no we don't want that one no, forget about that we don't understand that one anyways and so when Jesus came riding in on the foal of an ass people knew there was something different about him because he he typically did something only the prophets would do you see the prophets were kind of symbolic representatives of God's message living in the flesh. They always did some things that just didn't make sense. You know, they put on stocks and walk around with stocks on. Or they lay on their side, you know, for a year or whatever it may be. You know, they were always symbolically doing some kind of like allegory or symbolic statement by demonstrating it through their actions. And God would then, you know, people would ask him, well, why are you doing that? And they go, this is what's going to happen to Israel. You know, you've been like, you know, 
unfaithful servant and now I'll put binders on your eyes and you know lead you by a bit in your mouth you know so the prophet had a bit in his mouth and you know had brains on and whatever kind of weird but you know it worked because it was a visual observation of a demonstration of what God was saying do you know that Jesus is that visual demonstration now he doesn't need his prophets to reveal his word you know and just demonstrate by their actions what the word says Jesus is the physical representation of God's word and it's interesting that Jesus asked that physical representation Care for some breakfast? <laughs> Jesus as that physical representation of God's word demonstrated in his actions and his life for three and a half years all that we would want to know about what God wants us to do. Do you get that? All that God wants us to do is represented by Jesus' life those three and a half years that we have recorded. And we can just look at Jesus and look to Jesus to see what we should do. We can ask him too. James 1 5 says we can have a personal conversation with God. And all throughout the Old Testament, we're told God would speak to us if we would seek to listen to him and wait on him. But Jesus himself said, I only do those things that are pleasing to my Father. His actions manifested the right thing to do in the right place, in the right time, in the right will, in the right attitude. So when we read those things, we see what is the proper perspective of how to demonstrate our faith. A lot of people like to demonstrate their faith by making big giant posters, you know, gigantic banners, you know, and sky blazing, you know, special effects, you know, and have a mega church and a mega worship service and lasers, you know, going off and, you know, sound systems blasting their ears, you know, and people awestruck and deafened and dumb by, wow, look how modern technology has brought the gospel. Oh, that's nice. You know, Jesus, when he rode into Jerusalem, could have taken a chariot. I mean, you know, there were chariots around. You know, he could have jumped on a bandwagon. You know, and there were bandwagons around in those days. You know, they had wagons. You know, they could have. Jesus could have jumped on one of them. You know, but he didn't. You know, it's interesting that he chose a donkey. He chose a an ass, a mule. I wonder if it was the same one that talked, because you see, it's kind of interesting that Balaam was warned by a donkey. The mule that warned Jesus or warned Balaam, it's interesting that the same kind of effect, you know, was ignored when Jesus rode in on a donkey. It should have been saying something, you know. I don't know. Is there a simile there? Is there a connection? You know. You might want to look at that. Because God doesn't waste anything that he chooses to use in making a symbol out of or demonstrating how he wants us to be. I wrote a piece recently that I'm sure is going to get misunderstood because I always get misunderstood when I write things called Jesus didn't write a Harley you know and quite frankly I don't think you would ever find him writing a Harley <laughs> it's just one of those things that no it doesn't need to because A it's really not his thing and B he doesn't need status. So, I kind of was trying to talk about something that most Harley writers that I know remember way back when, when they were first early pastors, about status symbols. Maybe they remember. And how, yeah, you, you may have the money to buy one. You may have been given a gift to get one. You know, and you may have the opportunity to use one. But do you need to? I mean, really? Is it that much better to go to, you know, like to try to get a group of people, you know, that you're going to minister to that are already preaching to the choir of a bunch of Harley writers. I don't know, you know, that's between you and the Lord. But my point is, when Jesus rode in on the donkey, it had meaning. There was a discrepancy between what the people expected and what God demonstrated. 
And that's kind of where I see sometimes maybe we're missing the boat on some of the things that we demonstrate as opposed to what we should remonstrate. In other words, I know people that will go out and demonstrate against abortion. I know people that will go out and demonstrate against politics. I know people that will demonstrate just about against anything that they really feel emotional response about. But will they demonstrate the love of God in a way that manifests itself to the world in a way that the world goes, wow, that's awesome. You know, like helping your neighbor, you know, build a fence or cleaning up their yard. You know, a lot of Christian people, churches especially, will take like, you know, a high school group or, you know, like a, oh, I don't know, you know, junior high group. And they'll, you know, they'll kind of go out and pick on some place, you know, and sometimes use that as a object lesson to teach their kids, you know, how to be servants. But you see, Jesus lived the life of a servant. He didn't just do it once in a while. He was always about it. Everything about his lifestyle was obviously subservient. If someone wanted to say, oh, well, you know, that rich man Jesus, they couldn't. Birds have their nests, foxes have their hole, but nowhere has the Son of Man to lay his head. Because he kind of knew what would happen. And you know, the world does that. They look at us as the demonstration of God's revelation of his communication to the world. What in your lifestyle and what in your way of living shows the world who Jesus is? What in your way of living demonstrates to the world what kind of God is coming. I mean, I know for myself, I look at a lot of people and I see, whoa, they're wealthy. Now, they think they're poor because they, well, you know, you haven't seen my bank account, you know, I don't have much money. Oh, you got a bank account? Well, you, 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 you know, my house isn't the fanciest one, you know, I've got a mortgage. Oh, you got a, a house? Well, you know, I don't drive the fanciest car, you know. Maybe I got a boat, you know, maybe I got vacation time, you know, but those are things that go along with the territory. Oh, you have a job? You see, sometimes we take things for granted, which God blessed us with, but we don't use them maybe in the right way that God has demonstrated already for us to do. I know for myself, it used to be we were all the same, you know, it's like, wow, you know, we all gave up everything we had, you know, to follow Jesus. And God blessed some of us, you know, and some people kind of went back into the world and got, you know, kind of like some of the world's goods, you know, says, hey, hey, you, you know, you want to make friends of the world so that way you get some of the worldly goods, you know, and you can be a part of it. Well, maybe that works for them. But, you know, I kind of still look around and I go, I walked into a new church, you know, and I'm kind of fascinated every time I go into a new church by my first impressions. You know, my first impressions were very good, you know, and I, I still like it. I still like the church and everything. But I was fascinated by my own reactions to what I observed because I walked in and it was intimidating. Nice church, big, beautiful, you know, welcome area, you know, it's kind of like, but everybody seemed all kind of, you know, or do you know? You know, put together. You know, it's Sunday morning, of course everybody's put together. You wouldn't expect people to come the way they act on a Sunday morning before they get ready for church. Or would you? You know, everybody was all very pleasant, very smooth, very middle class and upper class. You know, very nice, you know. Well, that's what the kind of church I want to go to. You know, I want everybody to be clean shaven, you know, look nice, talk nice, be nice. Well, yeah, I guess. But you know, Jesus was a man of the people. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I go in places and they intimidate me, you know, because I don't have a lot of things. I know, like, you look around, you see a lot of plants, and it's like, yeah, well, they're 99 cent store. <laughs> You know, we're dumpster divers here. <laughs> you know, dive in the dumpster and grab what you can and cut it up and make it into something. And majority of what I got is refuse that's been used to become something that God could use in order for me to prosper in some way to make flowers or fruit or vegetables or grow something or do something or be something that inspires me to turn myself 
from the things of the world to the things of God. And that's really what it boils down to is, are your possessions possessing you? Or are you dispossessed of those things that you have around you? And you're focusing in on the unseen realm of God's kingdom, the glorious revelation of Jesus coming on a donkey, the knowledge that it's not about the appearances, but what God uses to manifest his gospel in you, about you, and around you. Have you given God back all that you have? You see, one of the things that people don't completely realize about Palm Sunday or about you know this kind of throwing down their prayer shawls, the talis, or their outer garments, or their robes, was that they were laying down symbolically their life. The lulav and the etrog are the things that kind of like are thrown down in front of the, the king who is coming. And the lulav and the etrog are those things that are we call Palm Sunday, and you know we forget about some of the other things that are the etrog is a sweet smelling savoring spice you know that we can smell you know because when you put it down you don't smell the donkeys you know kind of that smells like a donkey you know <laughs> no you smell the etrog because the people were throwing down beautiful scented things that were causing the incense or the prayers of what the people were saying and a lot of times people miss you know the meaning of what Jesus was doing and how Jesus lived and that's kind of what happens sometimes in getting caught up in the world. You miss the meaning. So why did he come? Did he come as a king or a servant? You know, did he come to serve or to be exalted? When you got saved, did you decide to become a king now? Or did you come as a servant of all? Are you serving with all you have? Or are you taking care of your family and making first they're taken care of? Because after all, we want to be a good witness, you know, of our finances and our, you know, Kind of religious life so that we take care of our own first yeah then we take care of the others <laughs> really jesus in those ways that the people looked at him wasn't recognized as the servant coming to die for the sins of the people he was recognized as a prophet coming and he would tell us and teach us and instruct us because people really didn't get it yet they didn't understand and they tried to make him king at that moment and started a riot and he disappeared and you know, he left them went in the temple says hey you know you guys deal with it I'm gone because he had other things to do he had to do the will of his father so when we demonstrate by our lifestyle and by our personal choices how we live what we live when we say we live it are we recognizing that all about us people are watching and seeing and trying to figure out is that the way a Christian lives? You know, is that is that what Christians do? What do you do when you're caught in those situations? You know, do you have an explanation of why you got all these things? You know, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good businessman. You know, the Lord bless me. You know, and you know, yeah, my neighbor may be a little hungry, but you know, <laughs> bummer, dude. Reap what you sow. You know, I gave my ten percent, so you know, I'm, I'm there. Or are we demonstrating by the compassion and the mercy we have that we're open with all that we have? We're able to lay down our tallies, our garments. We're able to put down our Harleys or our boats, our vacation time, our personal blessings that we've gotten for the sake of worshiping the King who is coming the suffering servant who demonstrated by his own lifestyle and choices that no one, no single person was worthy to be trampled upon or passed by without there being a demonstration of God's mercy and grace to them. We are not always aware of what God is trying to get to us or teach us. Sometimes we get caught up in things that aren't beneficial to us. We enjoy our blessings. We don't lay them back at the foot of the cross, so to speak. We don't give them back to God. We think they're ours to enjoy. And the reality of heaven, when you see the four and twenty elders, isn't that they got a crown and they're thrilled with having it and they stand up as Lord and kings, you know, and worship the God of all creation, you know, with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They take their crown and cast it down at the foot of Jesus. And I guess that's what we don't recognize as much as Catholics used to demonstrate and remonstrate 
the world by their own lifestyle choices, by taking vows of poverty and doing things that, you know, oh God, we don't want to look like Catholics, you know, <laughs> no, God forbid. But they were trying to prove and demonstrate by their lifestyle choices something that maybe we've forgotten along the way. That he became poor, that we would become rich. That he became less, that we would become more. That we are given a example of a lifestyle choice that we should be making. Not to necessarily become poor, but that maybe those around us we could bring up more so than we're doing now if we were less so about our own lifestyle choices. You see, the average lifestyle in America is like you got to have your cell phone and your, your, your smartphone and your iPad and your computer and all these other things you know that really involve a lot of investment of our monies, a lot of requirements of our time, a lot of necessity to take care of and provide security for it, because someone might steal it. Oh, God forbid. But Jesus wasn't like that. You see, Jesus could just up and go. And that's the interesting thing. He up and went whenever God told him to go. And one of the things we don't do as easily is we don't just up and go. If God said, come, follow me, as he did to his disciples, could we? Can you? Or do you need to talk it over with your family first, you know, your wife, your kids, you know, and kind of give two weeks notice to your job, you know, and make sure that, you know, oh, well, sorry, I'm Jesus, I mean, you're going to have to hold off on that one, you know, my, my mother-in-law just died, i got to go prepare the burial, I'm the executor of the will. Really? Do you realize how much God has already discussed all these things? Are we living a lifestyle that is obviously led by the Lord? Or are we living a lifestyle that is more conformable to the world and its ways? Because I'll be honest with you, I, I wonder when I go into church sometimes, you know, and I, I kind of look at people and I go, you know, it's nice, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, the fact that a lot of people can do a lot of things, you know, with their money. God bless them, you know. Be at peace, go, in the name of the Lord, do as God tells you to do. What's all the Lord tells you to do? That's what you should do. But you know, whether consequence of sin, whether just God's will, whether to prosperity or poverty, when I see other people that don't have and those that do have, I kind of watch both to see how they react to each other. You know, and a lot of times the person who's poor won't even bother to lift their eyes up from where they're at. They don't get involved in a lot of things that they would like to be involved in. But they're really intimidated by their poverty. When I see someone in sin, you know, to me it's real obvious, you know. They avoid, you know, certain people. They don't like to be talked to. You know, no one pursues them or goes after them like the good shepherd said he would. You know, the, leaves the 99 and goes after the one, you know. No, we want the 99, you know, because, hey, we have a building, let's fill it up. I often wonder, especially on a day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, by the end of the week they were saying, Good God, get out of here. I wonder if we are challenged in our lifestyle choices. Can we meet that challenge? You know, kind of like what I'm saying right now. This message, has it ticked you off, you know, upset you, poked you in some ways that, you know, you go, oh God, that Michael, you know, he's like off the wall. You know, forget him, you know, get out of here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just ask him. But, are we willing to look at ourselves and look at the message that we are, my lifestyle, yours, day by day, under the microscope, so to speak, every day, the world of state? Are we willing to live our lives like that? No matter what we are, whether we're prosperous or whether we're poor, whether we're in the abundance of worldly things or whether we're in the absence of them, are we living all of our day? 
according to what God may say and lead us in the direction that he chooses today for us to go? Or really, is it kind of like, you know, hard to tell the Christians from the non-Christians, except when they decide to add their little whosoever to their name, or they decide to add some, you know, status symbol like a Harley or a you know, Christian, you know, tattoo, or you get tats that say, God is with me, you know. <laughs> I can't imagine Christians getting tattoos because God said, don't get a tattoo, it's stupid, you know. But anyways, you know, if they want to, go ahead, you know, it's a status symbol, you know, it's, it's all one of those fad things, you know. Get pierced too, you know. <laughs> People do, you know. But one of the things that God said would adorn His people would be the love that they have for one another. By this shall men know that you're my disciples indeed. In that you have love for one another. I wonder why or how we demonstrate our love when. You go in a sanctuary, and I do. You know, I go in lots of sanctuaries. You know, and maybe it's just me, but you know, a lot of times I see. Hey, you know what? It's just like the pastors always say. You can see like the front pews. You know, a few people. You know, kind of like sitting up there. You know, they're kind of like the spiritual ones, supposedly. You know, but then there's some gaps. You know, and then there's you start working your way back, and there's big gaps between clumps of people or sometimes individuals, and they sit far away. Don't know that person. Don't want to meet them. So you know. Because people are so self-centered and not ministry-oriented, oh, let's take five minutes to greet and meet, you know, a meet and greet. Oh, it's time to meet and greet. Okay, hi, how are you? What are you doing? Yeah, okay. My name is Michael. Hi, glad to meet you. Hello, hello. And the people don't care. It's just a symbolic gesture. But you know, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people made a symbolic gesture. They Laid down the palms, they threw down the atrogs, they threw down their coats, and Jesus rode across them. You know, and they might have changed their mind by the end of the week, but it was a glorious example of a demonstration of love that they did because they were giving of their personal possessions the very fact that your prayer shawl or what you were wearing, you were needing. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Jews wandered around with, you know, six or seven coats on and they could carry it around the desert. No, what they put down was the only thing that they had around at the time, and they had to carry it around because that's the way you traveled. What you carried was your total possessions. And so they laid them down at the feet of Jesus. They laid them down for a donkey to walk on. They sang, Save Us Now, which is what Hosanna means. But I wonder if we have lost something along the way of not paying attention to who we are demonstrating of the kind of Jesus we're showing by our own lifestyle choices and the way we're living in what we say is our giving and our being Christian or Christ-like in ways that maybe God never intended for us to be. Especially when we see more and more people living a really nice lifestyle like the scribes and the Pharisees and not so much meeting where the people are at in their poverty. I don't know. I always ask it this way and I always think, do you know my name? Do you know where I'm coming from? Do you know who I am? God does. But when I find those churches that I go to, that I participate in, when they know my name, when they've eaten at my table, when they've been a part of my life, when they have taken the time or making the time to get involved in who I am, I've done the same with them. And you know, I never forget them. Jesus warned Jerusalem before he came into the city itself. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had only known the hour of your visitation. Maybe we are missing something along the way as we're doing it the way we want to. And maybe there's more we could learn from Palm Sunday and Jesus coming into Jerusalem 
and being mistaken for a ruling king as opposed to a servant maybe there's something for us to do and to learn about our lifestyle choices to make the right choice of what we're revealing whether we're revealing ourselves as kings God forbid or really servants like Jesus said we could be the greatest of all if we learn to be the servant of all those are the things I think about and those are the things I pray not just for me but for you today because frankly I've ridden on a donkey you know those little donkey rides it's a little humbling and I often wondered you know what if every Harley rider decided to stop riding their Harley for one day parked them all on one side of the street walked across the street got on their donkey and rode down the middle of the street would that be a demonstration of man humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord? Wow! Imagine that! A bunch of Harley riders riding donkeys. Now, I would like to see that, and I'd love to see it on Palm Sunday. So maybe there's inspiration for you to demonstrate in a way of your lifestyle choices somehow to be humble enough to be a witness of something that would blow people's minds if you weren't riding your Harley today, but you were riding a donkey.